All right, and we're recording. Hey everyone. Welcome to Hi. this year's BSD CAN Home Lab panel, uh, brought to you online because of what was going on in the world at the time. <laughs> Uh, so to start uh, with introductions, hi, I'm Alan Jude, and uh, I guess to my left in the first slot is Mike Geiger. You want to introduce yourself? Mike Geiger, uh, I own an ISP, Server North. I've been to BSD CAN every year except last year. And then uh, I guess to my right uh, is Michael Dexter. Hello there. I help people with their free NAS systems and ZFS systems, and the lab is very helpful for that. And then on the bottom row, on the left, we have Michael Lucas. Hi, people. I write books on stuff like computers. And then below me is Nicholas Zeising. Hi, uh, I'm Nicholas. I'm a FreeBSD committer since, I don't know, eight or so years. I'm working mostly with uh, with graphics and uh, stuff like that. So I have got a bunch of computers that that's needed to, to test and develop graphics stuff for FreeBSD. And in the bottom right, we have Scott Long. Hey, um, I've been involved in FreeBSD for uh, quite a long time, I've been a committer since 2000. And uh, I use my home lab uh, for a lot of development projects like uh, storage, SAS, SATA. Uh, right now I'm doing a bunch of USB 4 and Thunderbolt stuff. Yeah, uh, so we have have the panel here assembled to answer questions from the chat room and uh, share some of our lessons learned from uh, doing this for a while and so on. Uh, and uh, you can't see him, but we also have our moderator, uh, JT Pennington, uh, who will be helping us by tracking the chat room and reading out the interesting questions for us. Uh, so JT, do you have a first question? Yes, I do. So the first question, I am not going to try to read people's IRC nicks. We're just going to go with the question because I don't want to butcher everyone's name. Uh, what sort of things would you suggest to monitor power use? So I live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, and our hydro utility will give you daily reports. Otherwise, kilowatts are the simple way. They're a plug-in module. You can usually get them at most hardware stores here in Canada, at least for about 40 bucks. Um, and then the, the, the excessive solution would be to use a, a power distribution unit or a fancy power bar that has network monitoring in it and will actually tell you how much power you're using. There you go, Dexter's got it. Yes. There's the kilowatt, and I've got some notes on the DocuI link that will explain a few things about how to like do a PCI bus adapter to that. And fortunately, a lot of newer motherboards will include through their IPMI or IDRAC or whatever some power statistics, which is very helpful. Have you found those to be very accurate at all? I've, the ones I've used have been out by hundreds of watts. Interesting. I haven't benched it in any way and compared it to, say, the kilowatt. And I'm, I'm trusting the kilowatt, and who knows if they vary between individual shipped units. I don't know. But it's it's definitely a topic. Alan, I see you've added a few things to your doc. Yeah. Um, I've used a couple of the different PDUs, but they're generally you know, uh, only accurate to 0 0.1 amps, and even that is not actually necessarily the accuracy. Uh, so they can give you a good sum of like everything plugged into the bar, uh, you get a, a useful number, but for trying to figure out what each individual machine is doing, it's not uh, quite that granular usually. Um, my problem currently is that I've basically had a bunch of servers running in my basement the whole time I've lived here, so I don't have like a power bill from before I had all the gear running to really compare to. What's your heating bill like? Um, my gas bill isn't very high at all. Um, you know, in, in general, it's, it's my uh, kind of server room in the basement has a, an air conditioner that has to run during the winter, so <laughs> it doesn't necessarily help that much with heat. I, I live in a condo that has electric heat. So for me, the thought of, you know, mining coins of some sort actually makes some sort of sense, but I've never done it. So I started about five years ago, 
switch my lab over to higher efficiency components just because uh, both for noise and for uh, sound or uh, power. So going with higher efficiency power supplies, um, you know, systems, motherboards, CPUs that could be powered down, uh, put into low power aisle states actually made a big difference for me. Um, and also be, having things on remote power means that I can spin things up and down and not have to worry about uh, just keeping them on the line all the time. My lab is is mostly in the basement. Everything is on uh, some amount of remote power, even if it's just the, on the BMC. And I've just made it a practice to shut things off when I'm not playing. Yep. Yeah, that's that's what I do as well. When when I don't need a, ex, the extra computers, they're they're mostly shut down. Yeah, definitely. Like to to Scott's point, uh, one of the things I have in the notes that will turn into slides and, and publish as part of this talk when it comes out uh, in June um, is, you know, when I'm often buying used super micro servers or whatever, I generally aim for at least the X9 because the X8 grade hardware, uh, you know, was just that much worse on the power efficiency. Uh, and it's just, you know, louder and hotter for less CPU. All right. The next question we've got is, what is the best option for a full software switch? Think Ether Stub and Illumos with real ports. No idea. I just run switches with VLANs. Ubiquity edge rotors or X's are 45 bucks, 50 bucks, and they do tagging and untagging. See now you're you're willing to spend money there. I just wait and I wait for friends to throw away their ten gig gear and I pick it out of their dumpster. I'm I'm sorry. I'm an I'm an internet provider, so I, oh, sorry. I, I'm an internet provider. I have these things flying around. Um, in the notes, I have a comment though that says, "Remember, your ten gig switch will probably not talk to hundred meg or ten gig hardware." which is very startling when you go, oh, this isn't gig. Yeah, like even just some, like the IPMI, the BMC on, on some older machines is only 100 megabits and it won't link to your, your mm -hmm. one slash 10 gig switch. Yeah. And for people who are getting, uh, you know, good old Cisco Catalyst switches at home, uh, no CDP enable will at least make it negotiate a lot quicker because you will wait minutes for some circumstances for that link to come up. OK, the next one is uh, a classic debate. IPv4 versus IPv6, or do you go with a mixed environment? I don't think there's really that much use for v6 only stuff still. Um, so you know my house is mixed uh and it's mostly only because the the transit that comes into my house is from hurricane electric and so comes with a bunch of v6 uh it was amusing actually the other day because my windows machine in my home office isn't set up with the v6 and when i needed some to get to a site that was v6 only i had to go <laughs> downstairs to my office and use my free bsd computer so you're in the you please I also run mixed V4 and V6. I, I don't have native V6. I, I use a ton of, but for uh, for most parts, I, I use a mix. For stuff where I went the uh, actual proper DNS, I mostly use V6 because I can control the DNS for my V6 stuff myself, and I don't have a split split DNS or anything. So for stuff that, that actually requires DNS, V6 is, is nice. And while it's at home, it, it doesn't matter. I can do V6 only at home as long as I don't need to reach the actual internet. Here in the US, we've had some government mandates uh, for contractors and government agencies that they are to have V6 deployed. I think it's two years from now, and there are some pretty stiff penalties attached to that. So. If you're testing for the real world, you need to test both stacks. Probably for the foreseeable future, because V4 isn't going anywhere for a long time.
Okay. I think my ISP will give me V6, but I haven't needed it in the lab. It's an interesting experience. So you, how do you, you guys you, manage? Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. You, you realize how many mistakes the V6 developers repeated when you play with it. They, they, a lot of things that were thought were great ideas in IPv4 and then were later turned off, got turned back on for V6. Oh, IPv6 day in 2012 was a pretty eye-opening day for us at Netflix because we turned on V6 for that. And we found out that the FreeBC stack could only stay on for about a day running V6 because of reference count bugs. And we, you know, we find one bug and then there'd be, you know, eight more bugs behind it. So um, we actually did harden things quite a bit when I was there. And it, it's a lot more reliable right now than it used to be. But yeah, to Michael's point, uh, there's still a lot of goofy features in there. So how do you guys manage noise levels vis-a-vis uh, -vis the spousal approval factor? You did in the it's basement. Not even, it's not even a spousal approval thing. It's It can damage your hearing. Um, it really, really can. So like I was saying earlier, I, I invested in quiet equipment, um, cooler master case, uh, C-Sonic power supplies that are 99% you know, efficient and no fan. Um, the cooler master case, I, I put a note in the uh, document about it. It's really nice because you can put very large, high high flow, low low speed, low sound fans in it. Um, so, and I, I was very selective about the fans I bought, you know, trying to keep it below 20 decibels per fan. Um, and uh, like one of my systems has a water cooler on it, not because I'm a gamer, but because I wanted a big full fan on, on the CPU. Yeah, you know, uh, part of it can depend, you know, in my case, the stuff's in a rack in the basement in a closed off room so that um, we can sit in the office outside without the annoying drone of the fans and so on. Uh, but, you know, if your your lab is more like a bench uh, that you're sitting at, you know, having that blaring noise is really hard to concentrate and it can damage your hearing. Um, so yes, also in the notes, I put links. Uh, sometimes if you do get that used super micro gear, you can buy much quieter fans that you can put in it. Uh, or, you know, uh, like other people have done is rebuild it in a, a larger case that can hold, you know, larger, slower fans to get to kind of keep the same level of airflow. Uh, so yeah, like the that nice case that uh, Scott added to the notes or something like that can make a big difference. Uh, one, one note, let me add real, something real quick though, is that the 140 millimeter fans that the, that the uh, Cooler Master cases can take, I have not found a quiet oh. one of those actually. The quiet sweet spot seems to be in 80 and 92 millimeter fans and not 120, 140. On the door. Yep. There are a bunch of different uh, options for fans. Because, um, I, you know, I remember being surprised by kind of the lack of diversity when I was looking for fans with really high static pressure for building a Bitcoin mining rig more than 10 years ago, I guess, or whatever. And it was like, I don't care about noise. I want to push the most amount of air. Uh, and the, the other factors don't matter. Uh, whereas, you know, in, the, in this case, it's you want to make it quieter. And uh, some of the forums like um, uh, Serve the Home have uh, a bunch of good tips on, you know, what different things you, and uh, another thing that we talked about was, you know, these 10 gig switches. Well, some of them are definitely not suitable for, you know, a bench type lab where it's going to have some little fan, you know, like a 40 millimeter fan going nutty the whole time. And it makes it uh, not very useful because, you know, the switch isn't something you want to be powering off when you're not using. It's the switch. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes forums like that have good feedback on, you know, I found this model to be quiet enough that I can have it on in my lab and it, it's not uh, driving me crazy with noise. And that's one thing uh, to touch back on the power question as well is a lot of 10 gig, 10 gig gear is very power hungry and also very noisy. So the 10 gig gear does not run here full time. And maybe that's something else to mention, like in a home lab, it doesn't have to be 24 seven production. Otherwise it's your, your, your production now. <laughs> so, and, and never name anything temp ever. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> in the notes, I referenced the uh, red green quote where he goes, you know, it's only temporary unless it works. Yeah, but yeah, what I found, the biggest thing that you can do is take the little 40 millimeter fans off your CPU and replace them with a big, um, you know, heat pipe chiller and 72 or, you know, 80 or 90 millimeter fans. That's, that's probably the biggest single thing you can do to quiet your systems down. So the challenge I have with that is I end up with blade machines or, or 1U machines because that's what I'm either pulling out of the data center or putting into the data center. Um, and so that option is not available. So I go with hearing protection. Yeah. Because it's, yeah, it's those little right, right here on my whole, desk. <laughs> those 1Us have that whole line of, of little 40 millimeter fans in a row. They're going at about 10,000 RPM. And, and they're double stacked. Yeah, the yeah. ones my GPU servers are double stacked there, and it's just like wow. Yeah, and, and that will cause hearing damage to you after a mm -hmm. long of time. Yeah, I use in ears, which got Michael both. Dexter showing a few different options. Yes, yeah, so I've tried quite a few, probably five different models, and the 3M comes off as the most comfortable, whereas the decibel defense is the most effective you can buy, it appears, and it will collapse, and when you're Flying to a conference, it works great on the plane. Earbuds will supplant it, and you get a very good overall set of, you know, studio quality, you know, hearing options for not a lot of money. And there's always a point that you will do something noisy, even if it's just walking down to the, a colo or something. So do be prepared with those, regardless of the ambient noise, which fortunately has made huge progress as we've touched on. And that's why I have the in-ears because that's hearing protection I can always have with me. I can listen to my music and I have the hearing protection at home or in my backpack at all times, although not within reach, so I can't show, sorry. Do you think that uh, noise canceling headphones are a good substitute for just insulating headphones? Uh, so a builder turned me onto some Ryobi ones and I found some on eBay and I thought this is perfect for the lawnmower. And it's geared for like a construction site and it made perfect amplification of the motor noise. So your mileage may vary. I've considered those, but this was such a cheap solution to go with the decibel defense and some, some supermarket earbuds. And it's just worked out really well. Yep. There was a company called Lightning that made shooting muffs years ago. And I still have a pair of those, like 32 decibel reduction muffs. And Back when my lab was, was noisy, they worked really well. The other thing I find that when, at least less in the home lab, but occasionally with the data center and the hearing protection is you might be on the phone with somebody. So having something where you've got the headset or the ability to wear a headset with muffs over top is, is useful. As you're blink blinking drive lights and other things. Yeah, that's definitely been, been fun with, uh, you know, you're at the data center, you're trying to be on the phone with someone that's, that's on the other end typing stuff or whatever. Uh, and it's like, I, I need another hand and, <laughs> and yes, having some kind of, uh, you know, headset or whatever that just makes it that much easier. So JT, do you have a next question? Yep. I have another one queued up for you. Um, this actually kind of goes off the tails on the noise factor because Alan was talking about switches and the switches are, are sometimes very the noisiest part. Um, I know the InfiniBand switches that I have are asinine loud, and there's just pretty much nothing you can do to silence them. But the question was, how do you go behind one gig a second for networking without breaking the bank? Ah, going beyond one gig. Um, what I use uh, in my lab is the Ubiquiti Edge Switch 16XG, uh, yeah. which is about $650. You get 12 SFP ports and four 10 gig copper ports. Uh, it works pretty well. Uh, it's not exactly quiet, but it's not terribly noisy either. Uh, you know, mine is in a rack in a room, so I, I, I've i never considered how noisy it is that much. But uh, And then for the components, uh, Fiberstore, fs.com, uh, I usually, uh, for my rack at home, I usually go with the DAX because it's cheaper than pairs of optics and, and the cable and so on and less fragile. But, um, you know, I've also got a bunch of SFPs donated uh, from a friend. And so I've also used those. My answer to that question is eBay. Um, I think my first 10 gig switch was one of the Quanta LB6s, which is a 48 port, all 10 gig 
uh, SFP plus switch. However, I think it's about 850 Watts banshee in terms of noise. Um, and if you don't get the right firmware on it, you can't do one gig with it. So you're locked into 10 gig period. Um, uh, but I think you can pick those up on eBay for 200, maybe American, maybe Canadian. Turns out 10 gig is not that expensive anymore. And in the coming months, I think you're going to see a lot more equipment on eBay just as businesses shift to different working models and either have to dump their gear or upgrade their gear. Yeah. And then the other side of that is the, the actual mix or whatever that you put in your machines. Uh, again, eBay has been our best friend there. Uh, I've managed to get a bunch of the Intel 10 gig cards uh, relatively cheap. Um, the Mellanox ConnectX 3, 2, which one was it? Two. I think, Twos uh, the, are really cheap. Yeah, the ConnectX 2s I was getting for as low as $15 each. And uh, the one set I bought in bulk even came with the DACs, the, the cables included. Uh, mm -hmm. The hardest part there was finding ones that were low profile instead of the full height bracket. Uh, I saw someplace selling just the low profile bracket for more than I was paying for the whole card. <laughs> yep. Uh, I also once managed to get a good deal on uh, a Chelsea like uh, 520 or something. So that's uh, the thing that I use in my home NAS because it's really nice has some of the offload features and stuff. But yeah, um, the Chelsea, the Mellanox, or failing that, the Intels are probably your best bets uh, for FreeBSD support um, and tend to be quite good. Solar flare as well. Ah, yes, the solar flares. Uh, they tend to not be able to quite saturate the whole 10 gigs, but you know, eight gigabits a second or more is plenty because the, the solar flares are focused on low latency, which is also useful. And yeah. I have some quick comments. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go new, the Mikrotik 4 port and 8 port are like 150 and 250. And they even have up to a 40 gig with 10 for not a ton of money, or like under 500. They're fanless, which is nice. And you mentioned eBay. Uh, you'll find that, well, one, try to get the cards with both heights panel backplates. Some will have it, some will not. You'll find that, say, a 10 pack of cables is the same price as one single one. So really do your shopping. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of my chart, I sat down with my little PCI adapter and thought, okay, let's check the power draw on the Intel, the Mellanox and the Chelsea. And the Chelsea is by among the free NAS folks, like one of the top cards to get. But I was surprised the power draw was nearly three times that of the Intel. So the X520 or whatever it is, was the lowest power draw of the three. Maybe newer ones are better, but um, I've had one sitting in a system just eating up power, not even connected, and I hadn't really thought about that until I tested it. Yep. So what is your take on SMR drives? Are they utter crap? Do they have a use case? Obviously, there's been a lot in the news about that recently, so. They, they have a use case, but it's very limited in my in my opinion. Yeah, you know, when, um, when Seagate first started selling them as archive drives, that made sense, right? If you write to it basically once and never modify the files after you write for them, you don't you avoid a lot of the disadvantage of SMR. But well, even beyond then, that. Had, even then you had to be careful how you wrote to them because mm -hmm. like UFS, you know, if you're writing a bunch of objects via UFS to them, UFS is going to hit the same sectors over and over again, which is going to cause these rewrites that are really slow. Um, you know, ZFS is probably a better file system for it. Um, but even then, I mean, yeah, if once you fill up the drive and you start having to, to, uh, rewrite stuff, their speed goes down considerably. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good value proposition for, for most people. Yeah. It was definitely something I told people to avoid buying. And then recently we saw, they started trying to you know, submarine them in and, and sell you it without telling you it was SMR because people were avoiding buying the SMR drives. Right, well, and they were yep. doing it because they were saying, you know, we, we can cost reduce and power reduce a drive. We can turn it in, we can turn it into a green drive by taking out a platter and using, converting the remaining platters into SMR. So that's something you have to watch out for too, is that, you know, they, even though they weren't branding them as, as, as SMR, they were branding them as low cost, low power. 
and that's how they got it. The thing so, to remember though, for, for home labs, a lot of people are gonna be starting with just a file server. Um, and while my home file server is probably production, it has a UPS and everything, my MP3s and what few video files I have don't care. And that is a mostly read only workload. So in that circumstance, it's pretty okay to, to use an SMR drive. And I really don't care if it takes me a minute or a minute and a half to write, you know, something to that server, because it'll only ever get read. Right. And, and that's, that's a valid thing. You know, what I'd be careful about is don't use the same disk for your operating system as whatever your storage fault is. Um, because if you do, even if it's a file server, like, like you're saying, every time you want to go, you know, upgrade, you know, do a security update, or you want to update your ports and packages and all that kind of stuff, you're going to be really, really upset with how slow it is. If or it's even have 20, 20 drives. While you're writing to it and it's, uh, it's run out of buffer or whatever, and then you do something in the OS that does a sync and suddenly the OS is hanging for 10, 15, 30 seconds while it waits for the drive to, to rewrite a, a 256 megabyte zone. Yep. Yep. So yeah, you gotta be careful with it. Um, you don't always go for the lowest cost thing. You know, the green drives, especially the Western digital green drives, I almost always stay away from because they have other caveats too. They have a smaller cache. They they run the spindle motor slower. You know they have they have lower quality or lower speed heads. Um, so yeah, just stay away from those uh, unless you have a really really specific use case and you're willing to put in the time to make up for the money that you're saving. Yeah, that kind of leads to the other thing we talk about sometimes, which is we always get the question about you know should I tell my NAS to park the hard drives when I'm not using them or whatever. Uh, nope. Yeah, most times that makes it worse. Uh, especially, you know, ZFS tries to flush a transaction group every five seconds if there's any dirty data. So you're going to be waking the drive up anyway. So telling it to park when it's been idle for three seconds and then two seconds later wake it up again constantly yep. is just going to wear it out. Yep, that's right. And ZFS may think it failed. Yeah, that too. Uh, in the end, you know, if you really want to offline the drive, then you know, export the pool and and have the drives be really offline. But you know, you want your data online, so you're not doing that. So you might as well just keep the drive spinning. Save power, yeah, turn I, it off. I, I didn't know that parking the heads was a thing until recently. I mean, it, you know, that, that went back to like the 70s and 80s, you know, ancient hard drive technology, and it really wasn't a thing for a long time. And now apparently it's coming back into people's minds, and I have no idea why. Yeah, it definitely seems like one of those, you know, want to tune everything yeah, no. People kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, don't do that. You're just asking for pain. Right. And yet we don't know what half the smart parameters mean on most of these SSDs anyway. Mm -hmm. eh, we can go through that sometime if you want. I wouldn't I know what most of them mean. Because you've had quite a bit more experience than the average person. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why there's two that seem to be the same thing but are different. <laughs> Well, Scott, that's a panel that you need to pitch next year to BSD yeah. CAN. What do the Thanks. smart parameters mean? I'd All say. right. All right. It so will, that's, just Luke, that's just Lucas not wanting to co-author another book. <laughs> <laughs> Your point is? Smart mastery. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, do you reverse proxy through your gateway or do you use WireGuard or do you use some other VPN into your home lab for stuff that you require access to when you're away? Um, when I'm away, it's Open generally VPN just, on PFSense. Uh, mine's just a, a jump plus through my router. Uh, so I just use the capital J flag and SSH and just SSH to the machines on my LAN with the jump host being my router uh, because it's easier. Uh, I generally don't need to do anything like, I, transfer files really, uh, so that works. But um, there is also a WireGuard setup, but that's more for having the IP address of my house when I'm not at home. I'm yes. the internet provider, so I may have just inserted my LAN into OSPF. <laughs> <laughs> is that a good thing? No, but you don't know <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Remember, this is home like, labs, not production. 
So for my part, I uh, I mean SSH-J or I can just bring an extra laptop and I've got part of my home lab with me. And usually when I'm traveling, it's it's not to sit and do things in my home lab anyway. It's to watch talks, talk to people, and perhaps get a bit of hacking then. And usually I can live without my home lab for a couple of days. I have a Linksys router, uh, Linksys VPN router, and uh, I know I could have done things. I've done things with TSMS in the past, but when I bought this, it was cheap, and I didn't want to be a sysadmin for another box in my house, so I did that. It works pretty well with port forwarding and uh, dynamic DNS management. Also, for quick and dirty things, even on a laptop, you can use Beehive to to set up a bunch of machine CPUs need to quick to quickly test something. It will be slow if you actually need to build a lot of stuff, but for for quick and dirty testing, it's perfectly fine. SSH minus J here. Well, you know, Scott's point about not wanting to admin yet another box at his house kind of uh, brings me into Mike's notes on the, the lessons learned, you know, the shoemaker's children. Uh, just because I do all this stuff doesn't mean that uh, it works very well at my house. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I had a big phase where I, I got rid of my mail server and DNS and all that kind of stuff because I just I wasn't keeping up with it anymore. So I, I, uh, I'm actually happier about it now. I and feel like spouses, my... partners, and kids want it all to work, but go ahead. Yeah, that was the other th thought I had when Mike said, you know, oh my NAS doesn't matter. I'm like, well, at my house. Not just for me, but for other people, that NAS is a, a, a service that must have good uptime. Because when somebody else wants to watch something off the Plex server, it's got to work. You know, at this point, I will get text messages from my mother if my Plex isn't working. <laughs> Arguably, that's production, not home lab territory. Yes. Yeah, my, my NAS <laughs> has definitely crossed the line uh, and is, is not just home lab anymore, uh, which could be a problem. I, when you it, feels, it feels like, in general, storage is one of the things, as someone said earlier, I think, which you might want to, you know, have uh, some semblance of production on because things start to rely on it fairly quickly. Yes, which was my mistake when I, for Christmas, got myself much bigger server to be my home NAS. So I have like 40 cores so we can do transcoded video and Plex and so on. And then suddenly now it's also the machine I wanted to use for building FreeBSD when I'm doing development and stuff. And so that means that the OS has to stay pretty up to date, uh, which means, <laughs> you know, more problems with packages because it means I have to update it more frequently. <laughs> I feel like Alan. You Go ahead. I was I was just gonna say I feel like Alan, you and I are um, the poster children for don't make your home lab into production because we both have Ethernet circuits to the data center, the same data center. Like yeah. you're what a gig, I'm ten gig. Like the home versus production is really just the quality of the air conditioning and power now. So <laughs> yeah, uh, we both need to be very careful about not doing revenue out of the house. Yep. This actually leads saying. into another question we had, um, which I'll drop and then Scott can, can chime back in. Why a lab instead of just sharing legitimate infrastructure with someone else? Because you want to reconfigure the lab at a whim so that you can either test or experiment or most often prove some idiot on the internet wrong. Yeah, and exactly. And if I break something, then it's only me to blame and it's only me that that uh, has to suffer, basically. If, yep. if, if it's a shared resource and I break something, someone else will either be angry mm -hmm. to broken or have to clean up our mess and that goes both ways. Yeah, for the home lab, for me, it was definitely like one of the reasons why I bought a bunch of the spare uh, X220 laptops was like when I was working on the encryption support in the bootloader, I needed a machine I could keep reinstalling and blowing the hard drive away on constantly. Uh, or, you know, when I wanted to do uh, some benchmarking stuff, it's like I need a machine that I can reconfigure on a whim and, and reuse, but also be able to leave running for a week to, to collect enough stats. Mm -hmm. uh, where you know there's not going to be some other workload that's that's waiting to get back on that box or something or someone else is trying to share it, uh, and so, yeah, you know, for production stuff maybe sharing infrastructure with someone is is quite useful. Uh, but the home lab is more about stuff that I can 
break and fix on a whim to to be able to try things out uh, and to find out what doesn't work as well as what does work. When yep. you're when you're using real infrastructure, there's a there's an old cliche I like to use. It's that everybody has a, a test environment. It's just that some people are lucky enough to have a separate production environment. <laughs> yeah. You need a t you need a place to do stupid things, or yeah. you need a place to try things. I, I think yeah. for some of us, home lab is uh, equivalent to their test environment or QA. It certainly is for me, where I do the edge case testing of. Well, if I change this parameter on the Ethernet interface, what does that do to all the VLANs and OSPF and BGP running atop that? And sometimes I'm very surprised. <laughs> for me, most of the work that I've done over the years has been with hardware and you know writing device drivers for things. And maybe it's, it's hardware that I've been given to by a client or by, by a client that uh, is pre-release and I can't put it into common space. Um, or like I have a stack of hard drives that each have their own quirks about them that I use to test uh, air recovery in, in, the, in the driver stacks. So that kind of stuff you don't want to put into common use. Okay. Or you're what playing are you... Stuxnet. Because we all do that in our free time. So yeah, what are your thoughts on ARM? Is it going to be coming to the home lab? It hasn't think, already. Think, yeah, it's there. The Raspberry Pi has really, you know, allowed people to do little clusters and other clever things. So it's there. But also the you know, Risk Five is very exciting, doesn't have some of the restrictions and lots of activity showing up with that in Cambridge. Well okay. even the slightly more, you know, resembles a, a PC or server stuff like the the old overdrive one thousand and the new Ampere servers and so on. There are things that are actually starting to look like a regular computer that, you know, you can put SATA hard drives in and some PCIe cards uh, that are ARM based. Uh, and yeah, um, especially, you know, if power is, is one of the things you're concerned about, it might be better. You know, at some point, uh, the price will get to the, the right place where it will make a lot of sense. I think my Pentium D is going to become a Rock Pro 64 very soon. And that's my file server sitting in the corner because that thing is drawing, I think, 120 watts on the CPU alone. It's stupid. Yeah, my 1080p used man. to power my TV, uh, but then it wasn't good enough for 1080p, so it kind of went in the corner. <laughs> As we all know, I'm man. using SMR drives, so I don't really care about performance that much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so another question we have is, I'm going to move to a new house next year. It's still at the level of plans, so I have a great opportunity to prepare my lab from scratch. I would like to ask you for recommendations concerning the type of cables, optical or copper, and the best way for airflow. Any do's and don'ts, you, and do you have any documents or books that you could recommend? Why are the whole house with Cat 6A now? Yep. No, nope. just, just remember, uh, the problem with Cat 6A is that the cables are much bigger around than than regular, you know, Cat 6 and, and Ethernet cables you're used to looking at. Uh, so when I set up the surface mounts, the idea was to have dual gang ports every couple of feet along the wall in my basement office. But the surface mount couldn't fit that much Cat 6A because the cable is much beefier. Well, so that's the thing, Alan, that on your actual lab bench, you can do, you know, 5E or 6 or whatever you want. but for while you're building the house, I definitely recommend putting 6A in the walls going up to your rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, in the lab itself, you can break it out into other things. I, I have a differing opinion, which is put it in one inch uh, core line or flexible conduit for each wall <laughs> jack, because I, I lament now that when I renoed my condo five years ago, I did not put optical at my desk. And so I'm stuck with copper. And doing 10 gig over copper is just, no. Don't do it. I do it to my computer upstairs because it was too far and it was just easier cable to run. But uh, yeah, like in the rack, I, I mostly stick to optical. So yeah, the idea of doing conduit is, is much more flexible. It means, you know, it's kind of almost upgrade proof. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I go with uh, the 6A like I had mostly retrofitted into my house uh, before I moved in for the same purpose. 
So, so what I'll say is um, I do a lot of construction consulting. Uh, I am supporting a big condo development and um, electricians understand core line or flexible conduit. They do not understand cat six a versus cat five E. So asking for cat six a might get you cat six, but you know, it depends who's doing the build as well. So my, my advice would be go conduit. They understand that and uh, you can change it forever. Uh, as long as you have a one inch condo, it's nice because you can get one or two or three or four um, prefab patch cables into that. So you don't have to be splicing or, or dressing cables later. Okay. Uh, in my experience with the electricians, mm -hmm. they, they had to go look it up the Cat 6A and they bought like the spool, <laughs> like a giant wooden spool of it. Uh, and I was like, they probably have no other use for the rest of that spool. <laughs> And they only charged me for the part of it I used. Uh, but they also said, you know, we, we we can't we're not terminating the cables. Like they they bought all the the base plates and the and the stuff for me and give it to me in a box. And like you you have to you know actually terminate all the cables for the the uh, the patch panels and so on. Uh, and they failed to realize that for the Panduit ones, you need this special tool that I had to go buy off Amazon for like eight dollars. But it delayed me an extra week getting all the wiring in my house hooked up. And yet, if you'd had conduit, well, the, I probably would have yep. had the same problem with the face plates. But true. Uh, but what kind of what kind of home lab has proper face plates? <laughs> Mine does, but the, it doesn't have enough of them, so there's extra cables just hanging out of the ceiling. So this We've morning, I, did a, I was just going to say I, this morning I did a count of how many Ethernet switches I have beside me, and the number I couldn't count on one hand anymore. <laughs> And Alan, we have already discussed your inability to, to differentiate between production and test. Yeah. So of course you have cables everywhere. And one small point there. If you're doing a construction project, you're by definition spending a bunch of money, four figures, lots of figures. And by going with the conduit, you can sort of defer the cost and the precise layout of that network to the future. And I've done that here. And my, my one challenge is a, a office to basement run through the attic and thinking if that should be copper or fiber. But that's my one challenge. And I've pushed that cost ahead. Okay, so getting started with the home lab. Uh, what's the best way to go? One person says that they have a couple of spare laptops, but not much else. And someone else asked about rack mount versus tower machines that, you know, the rack mount would help for managing more hardware, but towers seems like they would produce less noise. And you don't have to buy a rack. Right. What do you and want you to do? have to make sure that, yeah. It also, you, if you go rack mount, you got to make sure you get all the ears and the rails that mount it. And when we're getting off cast gear, that often is not coming with it. Yep. Yes, I had uh, quite a bit recycled. of fun uh, tracking down the correct rails for some used gear. <laughs> and a friend I, gave me a rack about 10, 10 years ago, and I had it in my basement for about five, and then realized that I just wasn't using it, so I threw it away. So, uh, yeah, anything that, that, that's 1U is going to be really loud. It's going to be hard to avoid that. 2U, you can start gaining some noise reduction, but you really need, you know, tower or 4Us. And for that, you know, the rack just doesn't make sense. And also to to get back to what Michael said a bit, it depends on what you're doing. As I said, my home lab is a bunch of laptop laptops because that's mostly what I need. And then I can augment that with the desktop type thing or if I need or some storage or stuff like that. So I guess if if you're building something for from more or less scratch, you have have to start to think about a bit what you actually want to do with your home lab and what the purpose of it is, or at least what you think your what you think the purpose is when you start out. Yeah, you know, um, anything is a home lab, really. Uh, if, when, if you're doing science with it, it's a home lab, whether that's just a couple of VMs on your only laptop that you own, uh, or if it's a couple of spare laptops, or if you, know, you have a workbench with a bunch of stuff on it, or, you know, you have, uh, a rack in your basement. You know, my home lab started out as my friend and I, uh, when we upgraded our computers, we had just enough components left over that if we both put all of our components together, we had enough to run a second machine. And it went in the coat closet in our shared student accommodation. Uh, and we 
would run our downloads off of that uh, using the, the cable line that was included in the rent. And then we had our separate DSL line that we used for playing games so that we wouldn't lag out just because we were downloading. And, and my, so my home lab was uh, basically half of a spare machine that was like, I think we bought like a Duron 1.0 gigahertz to put in it. It was like the cheapest CPU we could buy and like every, all the old motherboards and RAM and disks and stuff that we had in the house. And it ran in the coat closet and made it very warm in the coat closet. Oh, one gigahertz that was our... for testing that. That's luxury. I, I started with a cluster of 486s. So, I just yeah, decommissioned because... a Goldfinger Athlon that was overclocked. Yeah, twenty-year-old computer. I finally decided I had had enough. If if you're starting from scratch and you think you're going to be doing the kind of testing and development where you want to be hands-on, I think the actual bigger question to ask yourself is making sure you have enough bench space, make sure you have good lighting, make sure you have good electricity and and Ethernet availability. Um, you know, because unless you're you're doing something where you're you're doing some sort of automated testing and you never touch the boxes. Like, you, know, you can just put them into a closet. You know, you're going to want to have the stuff out on a bench where you can open it up and do things to it. And being limited on bench space makes that harder. Yeah, you know, ergonomics and so on are part of it. You need to be able to be comfortable if you're going to sit there and working on it for hours at a time. Uh, yep. And, you know, yeah, you need enough space to work so that you're not cramped or like, losing components and they're rolling away and stuff on you. Uh, and you know, depending on your situation, you might be in the situation where you then have to be able to pack all this stuff up and put it away and not take up that space when you're not uh, doing your lab. And so that's why a cup, you know, uh, some used laptops like the X220s that you can get for you know 100 to 200 dollars on eBay can be a really nice uh, starting point because they're small, they're self-contained, uh, and they give you that many more physical machines you can do stuff with. But you know. Mm -hmm. if, and they're durable. Yeah, and durable. And also, you don't need uh, the separate screens and keyboards laying around or switching out uh, cabling for screens and keyboards since they come with it built in. Yes, there's a, a whole set of notes uh, about that in our doc here about you know uh, KVM switches and so on, trying to run, use one monitor and so on to power a bunch of machines. The problem is, you know, my old one is it's all VGA. And well, most servers still have VGA. Uh, most other hardware doesn't anymore, uh, or you know, even the mice are, are mostly still PS2, and it's like, no, I need one that has USB. <laughs> and then I eventually was able to afford what I had always wanted for my lab uh, years ago, or what I wanted for production years ago, and couldn't even afford was this fancy like AvoCent IP KVM thing. And you know, eventually they were cheap enough on eBay, but they also used apparently only 512-bit RSA, so like even Modern Java won't even talk to it because the SSL is so bad. <laughs> this actually, somebody asked a question exactly about that. Is how do you manage all of your really old gear where remote management or IPMI or whatever uses very old Java or deprecated ciphers? Never update your Java. <laughs> there is a, a secret Java config file where you can take some of the old stuff off the disallow list. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, it took a bunch of trial and error of just, you know, adding or removing MD5 dash thing uh, to a Java config file until I could connect to that, that Avonson. I have a VM that I use specifically for old hardware. Yes, and it or... has an ancient Java and yeah, I had a terrible yeah, switch yeah. that required me to go get Firefox 17 portable, which was just happened to be old enough uh, that I could use its terrible Java, JavaScript web interface because on a modern browser, it just broke. Uh, so I had to go get some like terribly old version of Firefox, the portable version to be able to run it out of just a directory somewhere uh, to be able to control it. So yeah, sometimes the answer is, you know, a Windows 98 VM or something uh, and you just, you know, well, yeah, that's that Windows 98 VM is sometimes cool useful for doing like BIOS updates. IS BIOS updates are another whole bucket of fun. Yeah. Free Dawson, friends. I have one cool IPMI hack, and I forget who to thank, but the Android and probably iOS app for Supermicro will support older IPMI 
systems that do not have the nice HTML5, DNC, whatnot. And Android x86 will boot under Beehive. So I've been experimenting with how to have a little VM that uses this lovely little app and you can just magically support it. I, I would like to subscribe to your newsletter. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's coming. That sounds like a BSD Now interview. Yeah, running Android under uh, Beehive and, and getting the IPMI tools working would be a good one. Under FreeNAS, exactly. So are there any easy ways to tier storage or compute resources between low power quiet devices and high power devices? The file server is production at home, period. Yeah, like I, I suppose some of the cluster scheduling type software could decide that to move that workload off the the Rock 64 to a server that I had to boot first, but I've I've never tried to do anything like that. That's, I, I that sounds like, very production. I feel like that's yeah, way past home lab at this point. <laughs> like tiered storage in the home lab. What, what are you doing? Like I have a stack of hard drives. Like they're just stacked up. Well, tiered storage or tiered compute. I've very much delineated what fits in a backpack, what will run on the Z220s, and then once it's once I've got the proof of concept, just push it out to like a Z820 dual Xeon machine for the essentially purely compute, nothing else. And someone's loaned me a co-located Dell R810 four socket E7, and it will build things faster than any probably everything I own. So just you know, plan out your resources that way and just find quick ways to drop an install image or whatever further down the chain as you need it. Okay, what are the best recommendations, do's and don'ts, resources, etc., for those who do want to do an almost 100%, 99% IPv6 only? And the person who asked wants to clarify that answers like, no, don't do that, don't count. Um, ask Bjorn Zeeb from FreeBSD. He's the only person I know crazy enough to do tests of like compile FreeBSD so that it doesn't even know what IPv4 is and make sure that works. But it's a very useful thing to do because you'll be surprised at how many pieces of software don't truly speak IPv6. And they would uh, I won't say that the authors would love bug reports, but they're certainly legitimate bug reports. I think my, uh, my I have enough IoT devices at home that don't have a clue what IPv6 is that I would still like to, you know, stream audio to my stereo or turn on or off my lights. What kind of security policies do you all have in your home labs? None. Big shell. Yeah. Yeah. Not much. Just, you know, in my lab, it's uh, don't get in my way. I'm trying to do work here. <laughs> yeah, try, this stuff is I, generally not exposed to the internet directly anyway. Uh, and I just depend upon that, really. I try to keep it on a separate network or separate VLAN from more my more you know daily use laptops and desktops and stuff but yes mostly to keep it from being able to break the normal stuff yeah exactly I, I have go ahead I have three VLANs at home uh what I would call production for computers the test lab and then the IoT LAN so, and the, the one I really locked down is the IoT LAN. Yeah, in my house, there's home, office, uh, management, and uh, guest. Guest. And uh, the, there's also the one that extends to the data center, <laughs> you, which is basically you know, the DMZ. Speaking of management, that might be a good idea to try to separate out all the you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have uh, uh, KVMs or if you're lucky enough to have serial level on or IPMI or 
whatever, it might be good to to have that in a separate VLAN and lock that down quite tightly because there there are problems with those kinds of devices from time to time, and especially if they're older devices, it might not even be possible to fix them. So keep some semblance of. Uh, or in the notes, uh, Scott has a whole section on on netbooting and so on, and notes that you know. Oftentimes that requires a different DHCP server with yeah. uh, more advanced settings. And you don't necessarily want that uh, on your homeland at the same time, right? You don't want just because somebody else booted their computer for it to start net booting uh, an image that overwrites the hard drive with FreeBSD or something. <laughs> um, and uh, like he says in the notes that, you know, like his Linksys router doesn't give him the level of control to say, for this MAC address, add these extra slices of DHCP and, and have it boot off my NFS server. Mm -hmm. uh, and so being able to have a separate VLAN for that and being able to, to automate stuff can make a, a big difference there. And there's a bunch of stuff in the notes and we'll get that into the, the slides we produce in the end. And note that not everything needs networking. Alan's bootloader work or jails that simply crunch on something and you go retrieve the result and move on. So it, it depends. How are you all monitoring your home labs? Do you have anything set up where you can get notifications on your phone or alerts by email or any other methods? What does that sound like production? Yeah. What's the Don't do that. Talking about? That sounds like production. Uh, yeah. The other monitoring is if the Plex doesn't work, my mom will text message. Yeah. <laughs> or I'll notice exactly. when I go to watch TV with dinner, it don't work no more. Yeah, well, Alan, you, you talk about Plex and, and that's uh, the Plex app that they put out for the iPhone a few weeks ago that, that lets you manage your Plex server from your iPhone, that's great for also monitoring the uh, the hardware underneath it. Mm -hmm. I use that now remotely to, to make sure that everything's going okay with that machine. One thing I'd say, if you if you have machines, especially machines in your lab that run 24-7 or close to 24-7, <laughs> keeping an eye on their hard drives might be a good idea. Uh, from personal experience, uh, I have had hard drives fail and not, they were fortunately in the mirror and only one of them failed, but I didn't notice for quite some time and you feel stupid when you do. Well, you, and, especially uh, you notice when you get the second failure yeah. and now it's too late to save the data. Yeah, exactly. And also if you do set up, I mean, it could be a good idea to set up monitoring in your home lab to if you want to learn more about monitoring stuff. But mm -hmm. if you do set up monitoring in your home lab and you actually want to use it and now we're getting close to production, um, remember to actually look at the monitoring and see if things are up. Because if you decide to have monitoring, having monitoring and not looking at it, then you might just not have monitoring. Yeah, I actually liked uh, Mike's approach uh, to monitoring his ZFS pool, which was just calculate the MD5 sum of Z pool status. And if it's ever different than it was last time, yeah. email me uh, mm -hmm. because it's it's that much more you know, trying to parse it and, and look for certain values that are changing is just never going to be right. But if it's ever different than it was five minutes ago, then I probably want to know what it looks like now. Yeah, I, I did that because I use Zabbix and it was one of the built-in checks. And I thought to myself, well, if any of the counters get incremented or it tosses a disk or scrub starts or ends or resilvers, all I need to know is something happened and go look at it. Um, and, and which is interesting that you bring that up because I, I do that on my home file server and I use it as Zabbix active agent. So it phones home to the production monitoring server. So, you know, that again, straddling that line of home lab versus production, at least that's how I monitor. And then again, because I have all the production instance, my home router is also monitored by, monitored by SNMP, which tells me very often when I'm testing things. Yes, that's, that's the problem with monitoring in your home lab is that the whole part of the home lab is being able to tear things down and, and revit yeah. them and have them offline for a while. Uh, and then you don't want your phone blowing up because of that. Yep. My monitoring at home, thinking about it, I make sure all of my systems are set to send me their daily mail so that if I get a mail, I realize I've left the test system on and I can go turn it off. <laughs> yeah, that's assuming your mail works. Oh, I point the mail at production. 
So you find out when your ISP blocks outbound uh, submission or SMTP. It doesn't happen yet. So another question that blurs the line between uh, home lab and production is, how much do you automate? Do you use Ansible, Salt, Puppet? I should, but I don't. Yeah, in my home lab, yep. it depends what you're doing. Like if, if for a while it was here, we're going to, to puppet the four machines uh, here in the rack because we want to test our puppet uh, and, and make sure we know how to do it before we try to do it on the 100 production machines. Uh, or you know, if I had quite a few machines in my home lab and I was trying to have them all be the same, it would be useful. But in most of my home lab cases, it's like each machine is a different experiment. And the reason to have so many machines is that I don't want to lose the progress I made last weekend on experiment X, just because I you know, new shiny, I want to work on experiment Y this weekend. <laughs> Uh, and again, especially, again we're, know, I think this is where you and I, again, straddle that production versus home lab, where home lab really just means QA. Yeah. Um, but the other one is, um, I forget my point now. <laughs> Sorry. Do we use automate orchestration or automation? Oh, I, I don't want something making changes in the middle of me trying to do an experiment, because then something changed underneath and, and now my results are not what I expected. Or it looks like I suddenly fixed the problem, but it's actually that it, it changed some CCTL and now <laughs> my experiment didn't actually measure what I thought it was measuring. Uh, and so, you know, it depends what you're doing in your home lab, yeah, but it can be a great way to learn to use the automation stuff. Um, but, you know, when I'm experimenting, I definitely don't want any other tools making changes while I'm trying to do an experiment. I would argue that step one is documentation, because if I spin up, say, a Windows 10 system and it's like, oh, what the heck is the PowerShell command to install OpenSSHD, I just go to the docs. And in theory, that could be automated. And I first have to have it documented to automate it. So I say just keeping track of, I, of MAC addresses, a sane IP scheme is good, and even the KVM buttons vaguely match the layout of the machines so that I can hop between the two. So documentation is pretty important for that. Yes, um, and for that. So the my biggest thing there, I'd say, is uh, be like Dan and Gil. Use make a blog, and then write down the state of the system before you start it, <laughs> yeah. and all the commands you ran, and what their output was, uh, because you'll thank yourself later. Yeah. And if you do run into trouble, it's so much more valuable for the person trying to help you, whether it's you know the author of the program that threw the error, seeing what the steps were, or just you know anybody else coming in. It can be super helpful to know. And yes, uh, you share the wisdom, but also you know. Uh, keeping track of what's plugged into what switch port and so on. Uh, so you don't have to go try to figure it out from the, the MAC address table and so on can be super helpful. Uh, it's, you know, uh, something I'm not always great about at my home lab. Uh, and usually I end up wishing I was keeping track of what's plugged in where and, and uh, you know, the, the, this cable goes into the ceiling and disappears and reemerges somewhere else in the house, but where? Uh, and so, your future self will thank your current self for every little bit you document. Yeah. yeah. Can but we talk about how many switches I just found under my desk? <laughs> yeah. uh, there's only one under my desk because there's there's two Ethernet jacks in this room. One of them is the 10 gig to my machine, and the other one goes into a switch to span out to whatever else happens to be on my desk. <laughs> I uh, just to go back to answering the original question, I cut and paste from my wiki. That's how I set up my home lab machines. All right, I think we're about out of time. Do we have any closing thoughts? I, I have a question for the rest of you. Uh, one big machine or many small machines? It Again, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> You know, when, when I was doing the installer, the, the encryption stuff, it really helped to have a completely separate machine. Um, you know, I did some of this beginning development in a VM, although I even managed to crash the hypervisor, <laughs> uh, which was fun. <laughs> Apparently, a, a triple fault in VirtualBox do not get along. Um, but uh, yeah, sometimes having the separate hardware is better. Uh, and sometimes it's just cleaner to be able to have, you know, five VMs on your one really big machine. I've, I've definitely leaned both directions before. Um, 
So both. I, a big machine and a bunch of laptops. <laughs> depends on what I'm working on. Uh, when I was working on the, the ZFS books with Alan, I had a machine with 10 real hard drives in it. And that would, uh, and I would occasionally randomly yank out a cable and see how ZFS liked it. Uh, ZFS complained, but put up with it. So, but a lot of the times if I'm like the book on SNMP, that was entirely virtual. And that those VMs just ran on my desktop. I have to run fairly well, large hardware because I'm usually testing 10 gig network stuff or storage stuff. And I, like Lucas said, you know, you got to have a half dozen or a dozen drives in it to find out. So for me, it's usually two gigantic machines, an overpowered switch, like that 48 port 10 gig thing with hearing protection. Um, otherwise, it's I, I get by with the Pine 64s a lot of the time and laptops. Powering power, that, that, that's one. Powering those single board computers that take USB power in is really frustrating when you're moving things around. The, the USB falls out very easily. Hmm. Or even just you know getting the right USB power supply that will do enough power and uh, for multiple of them at a time can be fun. Life is too short for bad cables and underpowered USB power supplies. Yeah. So they, they just, any of the stuff that isn't good enough is just into the e-waste. Yeah, even if you wind up with, uh, uh, if you got a cast off machine that looks like it would be perfect for your your home lab, but it has weird and vexing problems, you've discovered why it was cast off, e-waste, recycle it, yep. life is too short. Yeah, and it's good to revisit your home lab every few years and just clean stuff out. Yeah, even if that I, just means uh, donating it to someone else uh, to to keep their to you know build up their home lab, uh, it means more room for you to get new stuff, right? <laughs> I run a construction dumpster every five years and clean out my my lab. I, I I would say maybe every year or two I do a truckload or two to the uh, scrap metal dealers because they accept the e waste and. I might get 10, 20 bucks for an entire truck full of computer parts, but I then get about 40 or 50 bucks for a bunch of lead acid batteries. So recycling UPSs can actually be fairly profitable. <laughs> okay, I think that's about all we have time for. Uh, thanks for joining us and we hope everybody found this useful. And we'll have, uh, there's lots more uh, stuff in our notes that will be available uh, on the BSDCAM website. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, JT. Thank you all. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out to our panel. Uh, but uh, since I had to be pre-recorded, uh, I'm also here to take some live questions, since not all of you could be around about a month ago. Uh, when we recorded the, the panel there. Uh, so I'm going to start with some of the questions that came up in the chat room. Um, the first one being uh, from Daniel asking about home lab stuff. He's got um, a, a SCSI enclosure connected to his HBA and is wondering if there's any way to see the more um, topological uh, path to the device uh, in his ZPool status outset. So um, for example, um, if you have one of these SES enclosures, in addition to having you know, dev DA7, you will also have dev ENC at basically the, the SAS uh, worldwide ID number of the enclosure, you know, slash type zero slash slot four slash DA four or seven. Uh, that is a sim link to the original device. Uh, and this allows you to sometimes map what slot uh, a disk is in back uh, to the, physical, the the logical devices in FreeBSD and so on. Uh, so anyway, ZFool status currently does not support that, but ZFS does track that information. It does know 
the enclosure path uh, and tools like ZFSD use that to tell that, okay, that disk was removed and a new disk was put in the same slot number. I, um, if it, I, I'm gonna read that, look at this label. If it's the same, if it's part of this pool, I'm gonna run zpool online to bring it that device back up. Or if it's an empty disk, I should uh, do a zpool replace and start using that disk as a replacement for the one that went missing. Um, and yes, the chat room mentions uh, Sesutil is a tool that uh, Baptiste Dresson and I built to use a bunch of the existing stuff built by Alexander Moten uh, to make it easier to actually look at this stuff. Uh, and one of the interesting things that Sesutil can do is actually turn on the locate and fault LEDs. So if you have an array, a chassis full of disks, you can actually, you know, turn on the blinking LED for the drive that is dying so that, you know, when you go to pull it out and replace it, uh, you know that you're actually replacing the correct disk. So anyway, back to Daniel's question, Zpool status currently doesn't do that. Although in the newer version OpenZFS, there are some environment variables you can set to change what is displayed in Zpool status. It doesn't have one to do this physical path, but I plan to add one to do exactly that because that is a useful thing to have. Uh, so it doesn't have it right now, but uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I can uh, find the spare half hour or whatever to build that functionality and commit it. Uh, so the next question we have, uh, Ruben asks, is 2.5 gig or 5 gig ethernet worth playing with or should I just go straight to 10 gig? Um, so if you're not aware, there's a newer standard for ethernet that allows you to do 2.5 gigabit over the existing Cat5 cabling that might already be installed in the walls, uh, in which case the only advantage to 2.5 gig is that you don't have to replace the cables in your walls, which you know might involve breaking the walls open and so on, which is uh, you know problematic. Um, so you probably only want to use 2.5 gig uh, if you already have the wiring in place and can't upgrade it. Um, but if you already have newer wiring or you're not installed the wiring yet, it makes more sense to just go straight to 10 gig. Uh, and hopefully that answers the question. Uh, he had a follow-up question. Um, his other question was about dust. How do you control dust? Uh, he notes that one of his friends used the air filter mesh from a motorcycle uh, in front of the fans to help with that. Uh, yes, yeah, some of the computer cases I've had have a little mesh thing. Um, actually, Michael Dexter uh, just randomly suggested using the Swiffer dry um, pads. They're basically meant for uh, mopping up dust off the floor so they could uh, collect probably well. I don't know how much airflow you get through them and if that is uh, quite what we're looking for though. Um, and then Dan asked a silly question. Uh, what is the capacity of the glass uh, out of which Scott is drinking? I don't know. Uh, and someone else from the chat room asks, do any of uh, your Raspberry Pi, or do any of you use Raspberry Pis for anything? Um, I currently do not. I do know some of the other people in the chat room have used them to uh, power backup things. I think, uh, Mike Geiger uses the BeagleBone Black, which is like a Raspberry Pi, but a little different. Uh, or sorry, maybe the Pine 64? I don't know, some other similar device in order to um, make office backup appliances, uh, a little appliance that can be installed in an office, receive data, and replicate it out over the internet uh, kind of asynchronously. And there are lots of other uses for that. Um, for a NAS, I wouldn't consider a Raspberry Pi mostly because the interface to the disk is USB and that's just not great. Um, but if it's what you have, it's what you have. Uh, so go ahead. Um, next, Sean Bruno asks, uh, what is the most surprising tool that you use on a regular basis in your home lab? And is it a hammer? <laughs> um, in my home lab, I don't tend to use very many tools. Um, you know, when I was building my home lab, the tool I had to go buy was a drywall saw, but you know, that's a little different. <laughs> um, other tools, probably my ethernet cable tester is probably the tool I use the most. Uh, 
yeah, I guess. Um, oh, Dan asks, what is this picture behind me? Which I think you can see a little better here. Uh, sorry for the glare. That is a picture of a group picture from the BSD CAN 2016 Developer Summit. Uh, so during the tutorial uh, days, during the first two days of BSD CAN, uh, a bunch of FreeBSD developers get together and talk about hopefully you know what we plan to accomplish in the next year and things of that nature. Uh, and during lunchtime, we took uh, a group photo of the hundred and something of us that were all there. <clears throat> uh, another question from Sean Bruno was, how much do you love or hate IPMI? Um, I definitely love it. Uh, you know, there are definitely problems with having it exposed to the internet and so on. And, you know, it's not as good as it could be, but it also makes my life possible. Um, for example, right now, uh, my house is on a point to point link to the data center uh, where most of our servers live. And I can use an internal LAN to access the IPMI, uh, a VLAN. Um, and it means that I don't have to drive the 75 kilometers or I don't know, that's 60 ish miles to the data center every time a machine isn't cooperating. I can connect to the IPMI, see um, the console, and interact with the machine. Uh, it's also important for remote machines uh, because it's generally how we install the operating system on it. Um, we use a slightly customized version of FreeBSD that's laid out differently uh, so that we can upgrade it using ZFS send and receive. Uh, and so we have our own uh, kind of automated installer and everything. Uh, so IPMI is huge thing for us just because it makes it possible to manage all the machines. Um, sure, it has lots of warts and we hate it, uh, but you know, it's the least terrible option that we have. Um, Serial over LAN, we have mostly configured because sometimes it's handy to be able to access the IPMI without the Java nonsense. Um, the newer ones having HTML5 is quite handy, but the HTML5 version doesn't actually let you mount an ISO uh, and do uh, the install, but it does let you fix most of the other problems, which is handy. Uh, and as Michael Dexter pointed out, the Supermicro IPMI client now has an Android tool that allows you to even do the, the VNC stuff from a, a phone or a tablet, which is at least uh, somewhat useful. <clears throat> um, other question from the chat room. Oh, no, there isn't any yet. Uh, ah, another question from the chat room is, are there any good resources you can remember for learning how to do cable management? Um, I'm not good at cable management, so I don't know. Um, I bought cable management arms and so on from Monoprice or, or similar places like uh, Fiberstore um, to manage the output um, to get uh, like in the front of a switch, you're going to have a whole bunch of Ethernet cables coming out. And especially if they're fiber and you have bend radius concerns, having something that stands out and let you control the, uh, the bend can be quite useful. Uh, so the next question was, do you have a jump host in the data center for IPMI? Uh, so some of the data centers we do. Um, so like the ones we control, that's how we do it. And we have a jump host and then we can do a, a private VLAN. Um, for the data center closest to my house, the point to point link means my house is on that VLAN. So that's easy. Um, the, these are not provider provided VLANs. They are Basically, for the racks where I rent the whole rack and run it myself, we have our own VLAN that doesn't leave switches that I control. Um, for the machines we rent, it gets a little more complicated. We're usually at the mercy of the provider, and they have a number of different solutions, some of which are VPNs, which are OK. Some of them are just an IP whitelist, which is meh. Um, and a few of them have kind of like a temporary NAT setup. So you go to the website, you say that you want to connect to the IPMI, and it basically makes a temporary NAT state that says that IP can connect to this uh, internal IP and on this port. And so they, <clears throat> they take the session file that comes from the IPMI on the machine, which is basically an XML file, modify the port number uh, and the IP address from the 
you know, internal network ones to public ones on a different port and then set up a port forward that expires after a couple hours or whatever. So that only, you know, this IP on this port can connect to that IPMI. Uh, then Daniel asks, can we release that thing for uh, doing upgrades via ZFS send receive? Uh, working on it. Um, I, it's part of it is there as a pull request in the Poudre stuff, although I have some feedback I still need to address on it. Um, but we are working on that uh, and trying to make it easier. Nice. And Dot Blake in the chat room uh, provides a link to a uh, cable hall of shame, uh, making fun of people that have messy cabling. And yes, Chris in the chat room mentions that uh, those Velcro uh, cable ties are very useful. And we do use those uh, in uh, the racks at work and even the one in my house. Uh, it has uh, those Velcro cable ties. Um, have a couple of different versions of them. I think the ones from Monoprice are maybe not quite as nice as the other set I have, uh, but you know, I can buy them in bulk in a set of 100, so it was okay. And I don't recommend the concept of pouring concrete over your cabling and calling that reinforced concrete. Uh, it makes it hard to change anything. Any other questions? I know there's a delay on the live stream. So when I ask if there are any other questions, it'll take a few seconds for people to hear that. And then they have to still type out a question. <laughs> ah, and Dot Blake actually provides a uh, a PDF about actual cable management guidelines that might actually be useful if someone uh, actually wanted to read about that rather than just getting snarky answers. <laughs> Sorry, use the quiet keyboard. <laughs> So one of the things that I always found about a home lab is that it started accidentally. Yep. I had, I got DSL at home. And so I needed a computer to be my firewall. And I was living in New Zealand at the time and it then became a mailing list server. So, which needed a website. So I was running Apache and Major Domo and running the New Zealand ADSL mailing list from this box at home. And then I said, oh, I want to try some other stuff. So I bought another box and another box and another box. And, and soon you have shelving from uh, Home Depot uh, filled with computers, all, all desktops and towers and stuff like that. Yep, uh, that's a good point. I, my first home lab started uh, I guess really in college, um, my best friend who was one of my roommates and I uh, had just upgraded our computers and out of the leftover parts and spare parts, we managed to cobble together a whole extra computer. I think the only thing we had to buy was a CPU. So we bought the cheapest, you know, AMD Duron 1.2 gigahertz or whatever that was common at the time. It was like 2003, I think. Um, and we stubbed it 
in the coat closet uh, at the end of the hall because that's where the the switch router thing was for the cable um, because that's where that basically there were Ethernet jacks in every room and they all terminated in there so it was a good place to put the server um, and it started off just hosting a couple of VMs for uh, the classes we were taking you know sometimes we'd need a, a Windows server to do our homework or whatever yep uh, or a Linux server or, you know we were doing sysadmin stuff so we were learning Windows Novell or so Microsoft Novell uh, Linux and BSD, and then later Cisco as well, but um, we didn't really, Cisco didn't have the simulator stuff they have nowadays that back then. Um, but then it also became kind of the file server. It made sense that, you know, uh, if you're going to download stuff, you do it on that server instead of on our main computers. And eventually we had this kind of weird thing. So the cable was in, so we, we each rented a room in this house. Uh, it was an off-campus house with like five different bedrooms and each one was rented out independently. Um, so the cable was included in the rent and was shared with everyone. Um, and, you know, back then it was like three megabits down and 384K up or something like that. Yep. Uh, so we got DSL as well for just me and my friend. Uh, and it was, I think, 1.5 megabits down, but 768K up. Yeah, something like that. Um, so also that DSL was PPPoE with a bridge mode. So you could plug the modem into your switch and then each computer could dial a PPPoE session separately and get its own IP address. So we didn't have to do NAT. Um, but it meant we would basically use DSL on our computers to play games together. Like we were playing like Counter-Strike and stuff because that's what was popular then. Um, <laughs> But we would do kind of our bulk downloading and, and other stuff that would impede gaming performance on this server in the closet, uh, which also ran our VMs for doing our homework and a bunch of other stuff. And eventually it kind of outgrew having one machine. Uh, and then eventually that machine got upgraded and became my home NAS uh, later, um, which had just a bunch of different hard drives shared out individually. But then I fell in love with ZFS and eventually replaced it with uh, a ZFS pool one drive at a time and managed to you know empty out one drive and make it a zfs pool and and slowly cobble together this pool of a bunch of different size drives and then eventually replace that with uh a bigger machine and a better pool and then suddenly I had many machines and then i got onto the uh lenovo x220s which allowed me to uh basically buy these used sandy bridge laptops for hundred dollars and then having a couple of those around made it really easy to start doing freebsd development stuff especially when i wanted to work on the freebsd installer so i needed a machine i could reinstall all the time mm -hmm. but kind of wanted a real machine not just a vm yeah. uh, and it turned out those x220s had this specific bug that was really annoying so wow. having one in person rather than just working on somebody's in the hacker lounge at bsd can once a year uh meant i was actually able to figure out and solve the problem I want to share a photo or two. Yes. Do you see it there now? Yep. So this is an Ikea shelf that I had in the basement when I lived in Ottawa last. And you can see how it's secured to the wall with a, with a little L bracket there at the top left mm -hmm. corner. Now, most of these things are cast sauce. So I think the thing at the top is actually an I386. I'm not sure. But you can see two little UPSs up there. The black box um, on the top is actually a dual Xeon that I had built in New Zealand and brought back with me. Mm -hmm. and everything else I can't remember. I, I think my first FreeBSD ever box is on the second to bottom shelf, second from the right, the shortest shelf with the missing blanking panel. That's the original of, um, 386 or 486 that uh, I was given when I was doing a little bit of work for New Zealand Ministry of Fisheries. Jay gave me that box and some CDs. So that that box there is what is responsible for BSD CAN. Now, further down here, this is uh, when I'd moved. I, I think this is Warrington. I think this, 
I'm not sure where this is. I think it may be Warrington. No, this is still Ottawa. This is a different location in Ottawa because I see the um, tape deck at the bottom. Now, th this is definitely sitting right here where I am now. This was the last time I used shelves. And uh, as you can see, that's my desk in behind it. There are three tape drives on the bottom three shelves. And a lot of those are Lee and Lee cases. And there, you, can, you can see on the top, there is a wireless access point. Compare that to what I'm doing today, which is in the basement. And before anyone says no, humidity and vibration are not a problem. It's a concrete floor. Vibration doesn't get past. Uh, that's the inside of the rack. It has LED stripes on it. Uh, yes, I think the, the lighting rack, makes it look really cool. Yeah, the, 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 that wasn't too hard to add in. It's in the door, not in the rack. Um, this is not how the rack looks now, but it's similar to what, what it looks like now. Um, those two, one of those two tower cases is gone. I think that L that 710 is replaced by a 720 now. Um, these are, this is a DLT tape drive. This is an SDL. No, that, that's, a, that's my LTO4 uh, tape library. And that's about it. But yeah, mo I evolved to a rack mostly because I got given a UPS that was rack mounted and a uh, console, uh, a serial console, VGA console, what do you call it? Terminal yeah. console. No. So I got given a terminal console. And no, I, I won't manage to get a KVM over IP device. What the, the specific one I had wanted like eight years before. Of course, by the time I got it, it was you know out of support and in particular only yep. uses 512 bit RSA. Yep. And it's this terrible Java stuff. Yep. So getting a version of Java that'll talk to it just made it not very useful anymore. Was it a small little box? Uh, so this one was a, a one new thing that oh, yeah. gave you uh, KVM over IP for 12 or 16 different machines. Although I think I only had enough cables for five or six of them because the cables were more expensive than the machine even used. Um, but the chat room has a question about backups, which I think yes. is really your department. Uh, one of these servers, I'll scroll, down, scroll back up here, uh, number 16 is is the workhorse uh, that has about 90 terabytes of drives in it they're all spinning drives and it's that's where the backups go uh, once a month a copy of the full backup gets copied from here onto this onto a tape in this unit the dlt no sorry lto4 drives and that full backup gets moved somewhere else, hopefully, eventually. Right now, it's sitting by the front door. But there are two undisclosed locations in my town that I send them to. One might be a friend's place, and the other one might be a safety deposit box. Um, all the backups for all the servers that I have come here. Um, the database backups get dumped to disk via PG dump or MySQL dump, and then they get R-synced to home. I don't do a full copy, R-sync is much better. Um, and I also found that Tarsnap, I also use Tarsnap. Tarsnap works better on a plain text file as well. It makes uh, for better deduplification. Mm -hmm. um, Trying to think of what else I use. I know I use Charsnap. Oh, uh, the configuration for Bacula uh, and the database file gets R synced to four different servers, two of which are at home, two of which are out on the internet. So that if my backup server disappears, I can still get the catalog and the configuration files back with a lot of effort. 
yes, I do track the power. Some powerful old power inefficient servers. No, I don't really have any old stuff. Some of the old stuff is tape libraries, but they're not powered on 24 seven. I do track the power. I track the power through my APC UPS, which has an SNMP interface. And I log that with Libre NMS and it gives me a nice little graph. And it's pretty consistently about eight or 900 watts all day long. Those are other questions. Are sync with ZFS snapshots or just to copy it? No, uh, I, I use Bacula. I do very little ZFS snapshots uh, that go off the box. I do ZFS snapshots on the box using Sanoid, but I've yet to configure any ZFS send receive. It's something I would like to do. And of course it still qualifies as a home lab when you have a DLT tape library in it. I yep. use that for testing Bacula stuff. I'm also a Bacula uh, contributor. Haven't done anything recently, but my original contribution was the Postgres interface. Which lots of people use. Yes. I, I keep thinking fresh ports is probably my biggest use thing, but I guess maybe the Bacula Postgres thing is bigger. Yeah, because that's probably used on every operating system. Yeah. But I don't know. You've contributed lots of things that are very important. It's odd. Not to mention the uh, conferences, obviously. I, I, I don't, I, I have a different perspective on it, of course, because I don't see them as, uh, as, as big as other people do. Like, I look at what um, uh, uh, Pal did. I look at what Pal, Pal did, getting Pal, Pal putting ZFS on FreeBSD. I think that's much more significant than anything I've ever done. Quite possibly. Uh... And knowing he did it in like three weeks. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yep. It can't be that hard. Yep. Um, but it's all relative. Yep. Any more well, questions? Out, even even right. tiny things can be very impactful. Yep. And the Postgres thing wasn't all that big. It, it just needed someone that knew a little bit about Postgres. Postgres and could write the libraries and stuff. I literally took the MySQL libraries, copy and pasted them and started changing the function names and said, here, this works. And they took it from there. I haven't done anything else on it since. Yep. Hmm. I've, I've got some power strips that have some kind of amp meter in them and so on, but I've never looked at any of the smart house type things. And then I think in, during the, the session itself, Dexter talked a bit about the kilowatt and so on, but. And I guess, yes, uh, the big 6,000 volt amp UPS that I have has an amp meter in it, but that just provides one overall number. 6,000 amp? Uh, 6,000 volt amp. Oh. So it's like 5,400 watts or whatever. Is that like a, is that in a rack? Yeah, it's in a rack. It uh, takes a 240 volt twist lock power thing at 30 amps. I had to have a special power plug put in in my basement bedroom. That is I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, you did need that. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, I think, three U's. And then there's a second three U battery expansion pack connected to it. Uh, so the bottom six U's of my rack are, are batteries. <clears throat> and my, it powers all the machines in the rack for about an hour. And that's it. Yeah, I, I get about six minutes of runtime before I start shutting things down. And yeah, like in, in our case, we often shut down the, the storage servers pretty quickly because they're mostly just ZFS receiving backups. And so if the power's out for more than five minutes, it's probably staying out for long enough. We want to shut down everything but the router and just try to keep our, our workstations online. Yep. I My last power outage was 
Wednesday. Yes, it happened during the Wednesday tutorials. It was out from noon till about 4 a.m. There's no way I'm going to get a, a UPS reasonably priced that'll cover me for that. I also checked with my electricity supplier once. In the past year, were most of my power outages over one hour or under one hour, thinking I could buy another UPS and get over the get over the bulk of the outages. Mm -hmm. No. All of my power outages last year were more than an hour long. So I didn't bother buying additional UPS. Yeah, our power outages haven't tended to be very long. Pardon me. Um, but you know, uh, generally it's it's less than a few minutes. Uh, in the times where it's more, it was when a tree up the street fell down and took out all the lines, yep. or when a 19-year-old got a sports car for his birthday and tried very hard to wrap it around a telephone pole, did such a good job, he ricocheted across the street and took out another telephone pole too, and that left us without power for wow. like 14 hours. Wow. It really upset me that he got out of the hospital sooner than I got my lights back on. Yeah, that doesn't seem fair. Well, he did, uh, you know, yep. get charged for reckless driving and so on. But that was also one of the ones is like, I had just laid down in bed. It was like one o'clock in the morning. I was finally looking forward to getting to sleep. And just in about to fall asleep, I started hearing all this beeping. And it's because the power has gone out at one in the morning because some yep. knucklehead has tried to. I, I would like to, <laughs> pardon me. I would like to silence all that stuff, but a lot of the off-the-shelf consumer products don't let you do that. Um, um, so the 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 ones yeah, that we have on our our desktop machines do have a silence thing, but I usually want to know when the power's out. Yeah, but you got to get up and go and touch it. Yes. So in the basement, <laughs> if if the power's out, I don't I don't want to bother. I'll know it's out. Right. If I'm awake and if I'm not, I don't want to be woken up. Yeah. Yeah. So just do your thing and let it happen. Yeah. So yeah, most of mine now actually have silence. You have to hold the button for like five seconds or whatever. Yeah. Make sure it's the right button. Otherwise you'll turn it off. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it has a little screen, you can see the speaker with the line through it. Whereas my older UPS, they don't have that. The, um, I think if you press it once quickly, it might mm -hmm. silence it or it might turn it off. Yeah. I got about an hour out of the UPS in the front room, which is relatively new, and I turned off all the other hardware. But then eventually I had to go on battery. Yep. Well, uh, the next session starts in two minutes, so we should wrap up. I think we should get off here.